compassion, impartation of your spirit. Let there be a stirring of the treasures that you have given to each one here this morning. That at various degrees, Lord, each person here is going to go home with something that they have received from you as well as things activated in their lives. Let there be a continual increase of your goodness. Father, I just thank you for your grace this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Alright, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go around and hug one another, smile at them, and say to them, you look absolutely gorgeous this morning. fundamental doctrines or principles by which we need to know as a Christian believer who can come up and take the mind and tell me what is the six fundamental principles of our Christian faith in order Okay, don't look at your Bibles. It's not time to look at the Bible. Who can tell me that? Come on. What? Okay. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible talks about six foundational principles that Christians should live by. That you need to know this as a Christian believer. Who can tell me what is the six foundations? How many of you have been a Christian since you are born? Wonderful. Okay, what is the six? So look at those people. Raise up your hands again. Okay, those around them. Look at them. What is the six foundational principles? Huh? Okay. No one for the taking. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. This talks about The elementary principles of Christ. Hebrews 6 verse 1 and 2. Therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. 
and of faith towards God, the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the day, and of eternal judgment. I have no time to go in into this scripture to tell you all the six elementary principles. But the first principle is repentance from dead works. The second principle is faith towards God. The third principle is the doctrine of baptism. The fourth principle is the laying on of hands. The fifth principle is the resurrection of the day. And the sixth principle is that of eternal judgment. If you want to be a strong and victorious and mature Christian, you have to know these six principles. Because if you know this in Hebrews chapter 5, in the last few verses, Apostle Paul was saying to the people, at this time, you ought to be teachers and not babies, but you are babies because you can't take the solid food and you need the milk of the word and the milk of the word is actually found in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 this is the fundamental doctrine of our Christian faith let me go through it briefly quickly with you the first principle has to do with repentance from dead works. It does not mean, oh, just repent of your sins. It does not mean, oh, you have done wrong and you just repent. It talks about repentance from dead works. Anything that does not produce life is dead works. So in other words, you are to walk away from anything that does not produce life. You don't understand what I'm trying to say. So in other words, you can play your computer games as long as it does not produce death in your life. Some people can play with computer games they could have their PlayStation and they could have all kinds of games. But if you start to play with it 24 hours a day or 12 hours a day or recently in the UK, a father took the PlayStation or a game machine from his son because his grades were falling and they say that I think you play too much game, I better take this machine from you. And the teenager was so depressed, he committed suicide. Does that produce life? No. So anything that does not produce life, walk away from it. That is what repentance from dead words is all about. Things that does not produce life. If you realize that you watch too much television, and it's not helping you, that is a dead work that you are to walk away from. Is that simple? The second doctrine is what we call faith towards God. I mean, it's easy. The fundamental principle is how to trust God. How to develop a relationship with him. It's like to a friendship. When you have a good friend and your friend tells you something, how many of you will kind of trust the friend? I don't know what. Okay? I hope you all have friends. Even if it's only one. Hallelujah. <laughs> so you will kind of trust the person because you will share secrets with the person. Because the person can be trusted. And this is the same with God. It does not mean that you must have a whole lot of faith. 
What it means is that you have learned to trust Him that He can be trusted to help you. My faith in God started from this ten cent. I was in church and I needed to call back my family and inform them that I will not be back home for dinner. That I will be in the church. But I ran out of money. I was a school kid at the time. So I needed Tencent, because Tencent, Singapore, to use the public phone, no mobile phone at the time. So just Tencent. I don't even have Tencent. I just spent the last of my allowance. I said, God, I I have to inform my family. But I don't want to walk back. I can actually walk home and tell my family, but that's crazy, right? You are not going back. So I know that the moment I go back, I cannot come out. So I was just thinking of this. And the next moment, I saw Tencent on the floor. I picked up the Tencent, and I was so thankful for the Tencent. And I was able to meet the problem. Whenever I need money after that, I will usually pick up money on the floor. One time I was in Australia, I left a couple of bucks in my wallet, and I was in Bible school at the time. And there was another sister and a few others that uh, was with me. And I, I left a certain amount and it was just enough for a cup of coffee for everyone. And no more money. And I decided, let's buy everyone coffee. And I spent the last of my money. So my wallet was kind of left a few coins. And I said, God, this is it, you know, for the whole week my allowance is goes out. I just walked and lo and behold, there is a 50 Australian dollar on the screen. So faith in God means that He can be trusted. Two of my Bibles, I mean, two of my trips to, I mean, my trip to US and my trip to Australia. I shared with you about how God provided for me to go to Bible school. The second time when I was never, uh, that I went to Bible school in Australia, God provided the finances. And one of the best thing at the time that I needed a car, I was like traveling by train and everything. And I needed a car and I told God, God, I needed a car to bring people around and to bring my, you know, like drive myself to church. And for my birthday, I received a car. Provided for me. So it's not to tell me God can be trusted. It does not mean that you have to be, you know, like special. You know, it's like, God it does not show favoritism to anyone. But when you start to develop that relationship with Him, you know that what He says is true, that it is for you. That God's promises is for you. You need to understand this about the Christian faith. That whatever happens in the scripture is for those people that God spoke to. But from their life example, you can apply it to yourself. That God is a personal God. Amen. So this is the foundation of our Christian faith. Of the doctrine of baptisms. There are three kinds of baptism mentioned in scripture. One is water baptism. It means that when you go into the water of baptism, it means that you have been buried with Christ. And when you come out of the water, you have been resurrected with Christ. It means that 
you no longer live the old way, but you are now living the new life that God has given you. That is water baptism. The second baptism is what we call the spirit baptism. It's a baptism of power. What it means is that you are now consecrated to the Lord to follow His Spirit wherever He is leading you. That is what spirit baptism is all about. To be led by the Spirit. And do you know why we speak in tongues? How many of you know why the main reason why we speak in tongues? What? Yeah, communicating with God. But more than that, more than that, the Bible says, like what I shared with you last night, death and life is in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat of its fruits. Then in the book of James, it talks about taking control of your tongue because out of it can flow blessing and out of it can flow curses. You need to learn to control it. So the first evidence of the spirit baptism is that God comes upon you and gives you the ability to speak with you tongue. It means that you are letting the Holy Spirit control what you say. How could you curse someone when you go Right? So that is the first sign of the Holy Spirit taking charge of your life by controlling the words that you speak. That is why a lot of Pentecostal preacher or pastor say, pray in the Spirit. It means to be directed by the Holy Spirit. So that is what Spirit Baptism is all about. Then there is what we call a Fire Baptism. What is a Fire Baptism? It's a Baptism of the zeal of God, of the passion of God. How many of you have seen people with a passion? A lot of you, right? When you are passionate for something, some of you ladies, in order to look beautiful, you are passionate about losing that additional weight. So guess what you do when you are passionate about something? You try every way to lose that weight. I'm passionate about gaining weight. Oh, just kidding. I'm trying to lose weight, but I'm not too passionate about it. So it's still the same size. I used to be able, I was in the army, I used to be able to climb over a low wall just by jumping and using my hand and pull myself over and jump over. But now I just bounce back. <laughs> so that is what the fire baptism is all about. So for the Christian believer, it's not just water baptism when you become identified with Christ. It's not just spirit baptism where you are learning to be led by the Spirit of God. It is also fire baptism so that you could be passionate about things, about life. Because the Bible says in John 10, 10, I have come to give you life. Life in abundance. God wants you to live life to the fullness. But unless you learn how to walk away from things that does not produce life, you learn how to trust God, you learn how to become identified with Him, how to be led by the Spirit of God, how can the fire of God come upon you? So you want to be passionate. I saw some of you, the moment the game starts, some of you are so passionate. Wow, oh, you're already like siao, you know, like crazy. Wow. But when it comes to worship, so it's all about the passion. Amen? Which direction you are passionate about? 
than of the laying on of hands. And this is what I'm going to talk about this morning. What is the laying on of hands? The laying on of hands, is there something magical about someone who lays hands on your head? Does it mean this laying on of hands? What, why is it in the Bible? How many of you have a father and mother? It's a redundant question, but everyone has, right? How many of you got a comment, you look like your father, you look like your mother? Amen. Why? Because you carry the genes from your father and from your mother. Let's face it. The genes from your father and your mother determine how to a certain degree you look like. Sometimes you can tell your father and mother, if your mother is short and your father is tall and you become short, my dear friend is so short, now I'm so short. All things like that. So there is something that when the union of a man and a woman come together, it produces an offspring and your genes determine who you are. But in the Bible, when it comes to the church, How do we pass down the spiritual characteristic or the gifts that we have received from God? That is through the laying on of hands. It's not a natural thing, but it is a spiritual thing. That gifts can be imparted spiritually. In Romans chapter 1 verse 11 it says concerning Apostle Paul to the church for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established so that you may be strong so Paul says that he wants to come and impart to you or to give you some spiritual gift so that you could be established, so that you could be strong. I don't have time to go into this, but you can see that in other parts of the scripture, when you talk about the laying on of hands, it includes prophecy, it includes gifts given, when hand is laid upon the person. So when you lay hands, when a leader in the church lay hands on you, not only do they prophesy to you, they also can impart to you some spiritual gift. And this is how the church continue to pass down their spiritual heritage. It is not by natural means, but it is by impartation. And this is why it's so important for us to have mentors or to have spiritual fathers who can inspire us in all the various doctrines of the Bible that it is not just a doctrine, it's a living reality. It's a Christian walk of faith. So there are impartation. I remember I have a mentor that has this ability to grow legs, you know, like people with back problem or neck problem, and usually one of the legs will be shorter than the other, and he will pray for the people, and the legs will start to grow, and he's uh, he moves in signs and wonders, and I say, wow, that is so awesome. So whenever he do that, a group of people will gather around him and he will pray for people and the leg will start to grow. Then tumors disappear and all kinds of miraculous things. And he was my mentor. And one day I said, can you impart this gift to me? Can you do? You know, like, can you impart this? 
and he prayed for me and guess what I end up doing I end up praying for people with the same miracles because it can be imparted I have another mentor he is known as the prayer warrior that walk the nations he go to many nations and he will walk Bring in the presence of God and deal with the forces of darkness. But he was also a man called by the God to move in signs and wonders. He was a missionary in Guatemala and he was trying to share with his interpreter. He was trying to learn Spanish and he was sharing with the teacher. Uh, concerning his Pentecostal faith because the teacher is saying which denomination are you from and say I'm a Pentecostal and the teacher don't understand because the teacher only understand the traditional denomination oh I'm a Baptist I'm a Lutheran and so on and so forth so he went into the book of Acts trying to share that on the day of Pentecost the spirit came on the, on the people and he spoke in time you know what happened? When he was trying to read Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit baptized him and gave him the ability to speak in Spanish. Also, he could speak this language without learning. I have another missionary friend. We were meeting together and we were praying. He was a missionary to the Philippines. They said that one day he went to this meeting and there was a woman prophetess. And at the end of the meeting, the woman prophetess spoke to him and said, you will be coming with me to the Philippines. And he was so offended. He was like, he was thinking, I hardly know you and you're asking me to go to the Philippines. How ridiculous. He went back and that night he got a dream. In this dream, he saw a book open over his head and words came out from the book and flooded his mind. When he woke up in the morning, he could no longer speak the English language. Whenever he want to speak something, another language came out. In fact, if I know, uh, if I remember it correctly, for about three days or one week, he could not speak English but that language. He was a male nurse, he went back to the hospital and he realized that what he spoke was similar to the Filipinos. And when he spoke to the Filipino, they understand him perfectly. He was speaking in pure Tagalog. Guess what happened to him? He ended up going with the prophetess to the Philippines and he landed up becoming a missionary in the Philippines. So I want to share this with you this morning. That when you move forward in your Christian faith, that faith in God is real. Just because you have not heard about this, that does not mean that it did not happen. And a lot of all this testimony comes from people that dress like you and me that either got a fat issue or a skinny issue they, they, are, they are so normal with needs but they have learned to trust God and many of these people have prayed for me I used to be really timid it took me 5 years to share my testimony can you imagine Usually we have prayer meetings every Friday and people could come out to share their testimony. I was so shy 
I could never share my testimony. It took me five years to come out to share one minute testimony. Even when I went to Bible school and I was required to preach, I remember I was preaching in a false bank church all the way in home state, Miami, Florida. And I was preaching in this church and then for this huge podium or pulpit that by the time you stand inside, you can only see you up to, from here upwards. I was so glad when that happened because when I come out to preach, I was shaking so badly. I was so glad no one could see me shaking. Everything I touch start to shake. I still remember my first sermon. It was terrible. It was terrible. I was shaking so much. But the power of God came that day. And it's all because there are men and women of God that want to release an impartation over my life. They start to pray for me and they impart what God has given to them. Just like you inherit something from your father, your mother, you inherit spiritual stuff from mentors in the church. That is the power of laying on of hands. The next doctrine is the resurrection of the day. It has to do with the physical bodily resurrection of the day of the saints and the second coming of Christ. But the second thing is, it has to do with the resurrection of the day of people's dreams and of people's visions, of people's body. When you start to receive power from God, God is appointing you to go forward, to bring life to people's body, to people's soul, to people's spirit. When you lead someone to Jesus, you are leading them into the reality of the resurrection, resurrected life of Jesus. Isn't that great? You are giving hope to the wounded. I run a school for restoring the foundation that ministered inner healing as well as deliverance to, to the church. Right now, we have graduated over at least a thousand students in Singapore. Pastors and leaders are being trained how to minister healing and deliverance in a very safe environment. This is what God wants us to do, to bring hope to the hopeless, to bring life to those who are dead. That is what we call resurrection of life. Resurrection of the day. And the last one is eternal judgment. And it's very simple. Eternal judgment means we are living for eternity. We are not living for the now, but we are living for eternity. What we are going to do about it. Paul says this morning that he longs to come and see you that He might impart to you some spiritual gifts. And this morning, we are going to pray for every single one of you. So I want everyone to maybe after this form a few lines. Just form one line actually. And I'm going to ask the leaders to come forward, to stand in front, and we are going to lay hands on you. One of the things that God has given to me is the gift of faith for the supernatural. The gift of faith for the supernatural. To trust God when He speaks. 
He is going to perform or fulfill that word. If you need provision for your schooling, you need direction for your life, I believe God has raised me with the gift of faith for this. Because I went to two Bible school provided for when I was about 17, 18 years of age, a prophet came and prophesied to me. I was only 17 and 18 years of uh, sorry, 16, 17 years of age. And a prophet came and told me you are going to pastor a church. Don't worry about um, you are going to pastor a church. You are going to go all over the world to preach the gospel and you are going to move in signs and wonders. It was only about 10 years later that I pastored a church. In our very first meeting that we have, gold dust came and covered some of the people. We have signs and wonders. People were healed of all kinds of various problems. Someone, a nurse, She's also a pastor, had cancer. She came for one of our meetings and God healed her of her cancer. She passed out the cancer. Can you imagine? The cancer was inside her body was passed out. All the black substance came out after the meeting. And she was totally healed. So if you are believing for the gift of faith, this morning, I'm going to pray for you and I believe that it will be imparted to you. And I believe that each of the ministers have a different gift in certain area. We must believe that it can be imparted to you so that you could be established. At the same time, I will prophesy over some of you. I can't prophesy over everyone, but I will pray for everyone. And if you have your recorder, if you have like a phone that can record, or if you don't have that, just remember what is being said to you and begin to write it down when uh, we finish praying for you. Because those words are words that most likely will come to pass in your life. Just like when I was about 14, 15 years of age, someone said, you are going to go into full-time ministry. And it happened. My life was determined by God. But we still have a will to choose. Amen? Amen. So how many of you would like some impartation this morning? Another one? How, how many of you don't want an impartation? Praise God. I know this works all the time. Whenever I say, how many? Not everyone. How many don't want? Go ahead, okay? Just me everyone wants. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I use this strategy all the time. Hallelujah. Uh, yeah. Let's stand up together. Maybe form one line. Like maybe like a snake. Like a U. And all the leaders come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 